Father, we thank you for your abundant mercy and grace and goodness that you have for us. May your spirit lead us and may our lives be an offering unto you. And Father, lead us through your Son, Jesus Christ, as you lead us through this valley and through this time that we may arrive at the place where our heart is filled with laughter and our tongue with singing because you are good and your mercy endures forever. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who is so patient with us, waiting and admonishing and drawing us every day closer to Jesus Christ. And in your name we pray. Amen. You turn with me to John chapter 10. Let's look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. Good shepherd. The word good, the prefix to the word shepherd, tells you that the Lord Jesus is someone who you need to put your trust in. When you think about someone who is good, it's a future tense. It's, it's something that you must hope and trust in. That this person whom you might not know now or might not have an experience now, he is good. Meaning you might not be able to understand what's happening, but you must trust that he is good. So when the Lord says, I am a good shepherd, or I am the good shepherd, he means for us to trust in him. Contrary to everything that we know or understand, we must trust in the shepherd who is good. Because in this life, we are led by many things. And we are led by our emotions. We are led by the words that people say. We are led by things that make sense. There is a, the reality that is not affected by how we feel or our responses to the truth. And that requires us to trust. And the Lord says, I am the good shepherd, meaning we need to trust in him, in his leading, even though we might not understand why he is heading toward the cross. Even his, his disciples, when they heard that Christ was to be crucified, Peter says, no, Lord, this does not sound right. This does not look right. And so the word, I am the good shepherd, I will not lead you astray. I will not harm you. I bring you to life everlasting. Do you believe it? Do you believe this? It requires you to be outside of yourself. It requires you to abandon what you believe or think is right and hold on to what the Lord has said. That's my message today. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. There are people who claim to be sheep of the Lord. The question is, does the good shepherd know you? How do you know that? And then he concludes with, and I am known of mine. We do not know the way to eternal life. None of us do. We know the scripture, John 17, 3 said, this is eternal life. The definition is there. That they might know the only true God. We understand, we know where to find it in the scripture, but do you know how to get to eternal life? We say we have what we need to get to God. There is the Bible, there's the instruction. The same way that I don't need you to give me direction, just give me your address. I put it into my GPS and then it will take me there. Does it? It might. How do you know? You must trust in your GPS because it leads you. We have the address. We have 
the information, we need someone to lead us. How do you come to know God? How do you come to have eternal life? God must reveal it to you. Someone needs to give you the address to God. And you might have the address to God, which is the Bible. You might have the address to come to know him, but how do you synthesize this information? How do you understand it? You need a shepherd. You need someone to lead and guide you. We're living in a world where everyone is an individual who is self-contained and think that we have all the answer and solution to all the questions on our own. We can find the time and research, and then we can get to God on our own. And the Lord Jesus in chapter 14 says, no one comes to the Father but through me. We need a shepherd. We need someone to lead us. Romans 1.19 because that which, is, which may be known of God is manifest in them. Note this word, manifest in them, meaning it is already in you. There is no requirement for you to find it externally. For God has shown it unto them. We have it innate in us, but God has placed it inside each one of us, the knowledge of who God is. It's in you. So why can't we find God? And if you read the rest of Romans 1, you realize what he's saying here is that there is no excuse for us today because God has put in us the knowledge of God and yet we still can't and won't know him. Why not? Because we are not following the shepherd. Why aren't we following a shepherd, the shepherd? Because maybe we don't believe that he is good. Or maybe we think that we can get to God on our own. And so today I want to remind us to return to that simplicity of being a sheep. We need to be led by the good shepherd. We need to be led by Christ. I don't know all things. On the contrary, I don't anything. I need to be led by those who are closer to Christ. I don't see Christ. And yet we want to bypass, take shortcuts, and do what we believe that we have the capacity and, and the, the knowledge. But today I want us to return to the Good Shepherd, to be led by Him. Because there are so many believers don't know where to go. And we think that we can somehow stumble our way to God. This pandemic of ignorance is what you should be afraid of. Not this virus. That plague Christians' life. We spread it from person to person through our ignorance of who Christ is and who we are. We think we are more than who we are. And this ignorance is holding us in the state of spiritual stagnation, paralysis. Do you have a private spiritual life? When no one outside of this church, this responsibility that we do, do you have and do you spend time with the Lord? Do you love Him? There are many voices sounding in the ether today and on the internet and through your friends. Many voices calling us, drawing us, and the voices that make sense to you are the ones that you will follow. Today, there's this voice. Tomorrow, there's that voice. And in the midst of all this, there's one voice that's calling out to you. It's the small voice still voice. That is the voice of the Good Shepherd. A dangerous world. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy, Yea, 
and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This is a promise. He did not say this to anyone. He said it to Timothy, his protege. He's saying it to someone he, who knows that his life is determined to go full length for Christ. And he said, you will be persecuted, Timothy. If you desire to live a godly life, people will persecute you from outside and from inside and from your own life. We are persecuted every day. You try to wake up this morning, there's persecution from your flesh. I don't want to. The Lord tells his disciples that they will inherit tribulation in the world. Look at our master, the good shepherd. He was maligned. He was persecuted and killed because he showed us God's love. Paul's life and ministry epitomized this cruelty. Let me read to you this long passage, but you can follow along in 2 Corinthians. I want to read to you this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 28. Of the Jews, five times received 40 stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Thrice is three times. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils by in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches. Thank you, Paul, for sharing that. It brings comfort, doesn't it, to us who are battling in comparison to this godly man insignificant things that we are going through. I'm, I'm looking at this last verse here. and said, besides those things, all of these, these things that come on his flesh, he said, besides all these things, this is the thing that most weighty and most heavy and most dramatic in terms of persecution to him. And that is coming from the weight of glory that is on him. And this is what he said, besides those things that are without, they don't affect me that much. But the things that affect me much, this is why he said, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. This is the weight of glory. This is what most burdensome to many ministers of Christ today. It's not the external things. It's not what people say. It is the health of it is your health. It is your life. It is your spiritual life and your walk with God that is most heavy on the pastors. Not things that are without. You want to follow Christ, count the cost. Count the cost. It will cost you dearly. Jesus says you must count the cost before you build this house. Or people will laugh at you. Unless God, the good shepherd, leads you. Tribulation, a distress, a persecution, a famine, a nakedness, a peril, a sword. These things will devour you. But if the Lord is your shepherd, these things do not move you. Principalities, powers, angels, things above, things below. Height, depth, none of these things move us. None of these things will make us stumble because we go by the leading of the Good Shepherd. Jesus talked about two characters in here the thief and the Good Shepherd. 
John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. We don't simply just walk into the kingdom of God. There's a struggle against the flesh. There's a struggle against the call of the Lord and our desires and the call of the world. There's a struggle. We need to battle this flesh first. And we need to follow the good shepherd because there's a thief out there. Christians face the danger because we are strangers in this life. Peter tells us we are strangers and pilgrims. We don't belong here. And with anything, especially now, when we see strangers, we don't like them. The world sees the Christian and hates them. The thief, as Jesus called him, has one purpose, and that is to destroy your spiritual life. It might not come like something that is clear for you to see. It comes in small doses, like poison. When you give yourself away to these insignificant things, slowly they accumulate in your life and they overtake you. And over time, you don't know why you do certain things because it's driven you to compulsion. Have you ever pick up your phone Unlock it and looking at it, and then turn it off. And you have no idea why you just did that. Are you even aware of that? See, the thief and the robbers, they're not naive. They don't just show up in the daytime, knock on your door, and say, hey, I'm coming in to rob you. That's subtle. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He would do it when you are not aware. And slowly your heart is hardened. Your mind is changed and persuaded. And pretty soon you depart from the way of truth and you don't know it. We don't fight with flesh and blood. We don't war with this life or with this flesh. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we battle principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world. This world is ruled by principalities and the darkness. That's the forces. Do you see them? Do you see principalities? Do you see powers? Do you even know and aware of these forces? Ignorance will consume us. Our weapons, therefore, need to be spiritual and not carnal, Paul tells us. We must fight not by bending the bowls, but by bending our knees in prayer. Do you pray? When Rapsheke came from the Assyrian to King Hezekiah, and he said all these things, all these vile things, to the people. And King Hezekiah heard it. His response is this. People, be quiet. Don't respond to Rapsheke. And he took these accusations the king of Assyria sent by the way of his messenger to King Hezekiah. And he spread them before the Lord. And he prayed to God. We will not win principalities, powers, and rulers of this world by fighting with our hands and our fists or with our weapons. We fight and win by the power of God when we pray. Do you pray? Do you spend time daily in prayer? Do you have that time where you spend in prayer? Do you have an inner spiritual life with Christ alone? Or does it always have to be with someone? Do you have that walk with Christ alone? Or is that strange? The world has become hostile, very hostile to Christians. 
it's hard to be a Christian now. It's easy to be anything you can invent today. But today, being a Christian is something to be ashamed of. Spiritual wickedness has transformed itself into an angel of light. It is dispensing evil. It is changing your mind from the inside without you knowing it. It is shaping your thoughts. It is shaping your life. This contagion builds itself as moral platitudes. Dispensing itself even through the churches. What Jesus says offend many people. What Jesus says offend this age, this generation, greatly. The world is a vile cesspool of sin and iniquity. It's not clean. But this is where Christ called us. This is where he came down. This is where he ministered. And this is where we are. He planted this church right here in the middle of all this iniquity. Because Jesus loves the sinner. I was once a sinner before I know Christ. If he did not come, I would not have been saved. Jesus loves the sinner. And he commissioned us, the church, to bring the gospel to the poor, the destitute of hope. We are called to lead others to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is not without danger. Try to cross the path, the valley of the shadow of death. Try to go to Jericho. See what happens. You will meet the robbers and the thief, and you might recognize some of them. The thieves and the robbers might be our acquaintance, familiar faces. I'm telling you this so that you won't be surprised. In the world, you will have many dangers and persecution. The Apostle Paul again came with the words of encouragement for us in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, for me at least. After he has been stoned and left dead at Iconium, this is what he says. He went about and confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Thank you, Paul. It confirms that a good life is probably not led by a good shepherd. A good shepherd will lead you to the truth. And the truth, it hurts. Overcoming the thieves and robbers require you to follow the good shepherd. Are you being led by the good shepherd? Are you his sheep? John Newton reminds us that this present tribulation that we go through is transient. And ultimately, God's grace will lead us home. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. This grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. It's okay. You can sing. Grace will lead you home. God is good. We are led by the good shepherd. I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, Jesus tells us. The thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. The good shepherd comes to give you life. And hear the word, abundant life. What does it mean when he say, I give you life abundantly? More abundantly points to a continual giving from the Lord. You see, Jesus doesn't say that he only give you once. He said he leads you. There is a continual presence that you have with Christ in your life as a good shepherd. The thief comes and he steals and then he destroys what remains. And then that's it. It's over. You're gone. 
But the good shepherd comes and he stays with you. He leads you and he guides you through this valley. Because he is eternal, your joy will be eternal. Your life will be eternal because we have an eternal shepherd. I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. This is hard. The quality and the qualification of a good shepherd is one that gives his life. I think about the salmon, the salmon run. They spent their life in the ocean, and at spawning season, they go back to where they came, where they spawned, where they originated. And on their way back, some and a lot of them don't make it. They die. And their carcass sink to the bottom if they don't get picked up by bears or birds. And some that get to the head, the source, and they spawn. And because they spent the whole adult life in the ocean where the water is saltier. So their, their body is composed differently now. When they come back into the fresh water to spawn the body begins to deteriorate. And they only have enough energy and substance to survive until the spawning. After they spawn the eggs, they die. And they float back downstream. And the body sinks to the bottom and deteriorates and become, well, food for all the inhabitants in that river stream and become part of the ecosystem. And then these eggs hatch and becomes little salmon before we take them and put them in our sushi and sashimi. The ones that survive human hatch and become these little tiny salmon and become, begin the journey back out into the sea. And as it swims out into the sea, it flows into the bottom of these rivers and begin to eat the carcass that their parents litter on the floor. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Does this offend you? This offend many people. And Jesus says, if you don't eat my flesh or drink my blood, you have no portion with me. Does this offend you? Does this offend you? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 15. And the father knoweth me, so know I the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Again and again, he's talking about giving himself to us. This is what the good shepherd does. Do those little salmon, the fry, do they know? that they're eating their parents. We don't. But without them, we won't make it to the sea. Without Christ, we will not make it to the promises of God. We will not make it into the kingdom of heaven. So we take it for granted. And when we come to know, we say, no, this is unacceptable. This, this conflict with my morality There are many voices in the world. In verse 3, Jesus says, The sheep hear his voice. He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Jesus calls my name. Think about that. Jesus calls your name. He calls you by your name. He knows your name. Do you hear his voice? Do you hear the voice of the good shepherd? Can you discern his voice from the voices that's inside your head or from other people's head? He knows you by name. The shepherd calls his sheep by their name because he has given birth to them. We are born into the kingdom of God by the Holy Spirit and by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us our names. He knows us by name. The Bible tells us, you are precious before the Lord. He knows you. 
You are not one among many. You are one with Him. Just you and the Lord. You are an individual, intimately known by your Creator. Jesus knows you. Do you believe this? A place exists in Christ that's reserved for you, that has your name on it. When you come to God's table at the end of this valley, there's a table prepared before me in the presence of my enemy, and on that table is your name on there. There's your name that God's put on there. There's a place reserved for you. Do you believe this? Jesus knows us. He knows your name. He will lead you there. You will get there. Find this place. Turn off the noises because you won't be able to hear his voice through the noises. Elijah had to go up into the mountain and wait until all the fires and earthquake stops and then he hears the still small voice. He leads you out. The verse continues. And leadeth them out. He leads you out. The shepherd's job is to lead. We think the shepherd's job is to hold us in his arms. No. The shepherd's job is to lead you. We need to go from place to place because there is a mission that the shepherd has for us. We must travel with the shepherd in this world. We cannot stay in one place. When Jesus fed the thousands, the disciples saw the multitude and asked the Lord, can we stay here, Lord? Can we build a mega church? Well, they actually didn't say that. That's, that's my word. But they wanted to stay there. There's enough people here, 5,000 people, not including women and children. It's a good place. 5,000 is a lot of people. This is what he said, Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore I came forth. Jesus has a mission. We all have mission from the Lord. And the good shepherd will lead us. He leads us out from the place of comfort. We are called to follow the shepherd to preach the good news. The shepherd's voice. Verse 4, and he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The shepherd leads the church by his voice, not by the whip, not by the hook, not by the chain. He leads the church by his voice. The word of God is our good shepherd. In the beginning was the word of the Word was with God. The Word was God. The Logos is the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is the Good Shepherd. It is His voice that is resonating through His Word. They know His voice. His sheep knows His voice. People of Jesus know and are familiar with the Bible. If Jesus is the subject and object of our love, we will devour everything he says. Do you love Jesus? If you do, then you spend your time devouring his word. Otherwise, how would you know his voice? How would you know his voice if you don't know his word? By consuming Christ's word, we are transformed by the Holy Spirit who makes the word come alive in us. There are two ingredients. One is the text, and the other is the spirit. John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We must know the Word of God. We must study this. We must study this. Like Joshua says, day and night, meditate on it. This is our purpose. This is our voice that we need to be familiar with. There are other voices. 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Become familiar with the world's vernacular, and soon you will be led by it. You spend enough time with it, you will like it. You spend enough time with the world, well, you will like it. It will become part of you. You will advocate for it. You will fight and die for it if you spend enough time with it. There are voices in this world that will lead you away from Christ. And if you spend more time with the world and less time with Christ or no time at all with the Good Shepherd, you will be led by the world and you will be consumed by it. Do not be deceived. What you consume, you will become. If you do not consume the Word of God, you become like the world. Listen to it. Wallow in it, and you will become it. In verse 5, And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. The priest in the Old Testament, when they give a sacrifice, they take the blood of the sacrifice and put it on one of their ears. Just one. Signifying that they are no longer listening to the world. They only have one focus and one attention, and that is coming from the Lord only. That's what we need to do. We need to put the blood of Christ on our ears, on one of our ears, and pay attention only to the voice of the shepherd, or you will be led astray. Imagine a lover has many other voices coming. In the end, it's about relationship. I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. The good shepherd knows the sheep. I'm not Christ. So I don't, and I can't tell you which one or who the Lord knows. I don't. Jesus does. And this is what he says. He said, regarding those that the Father has given to him, there is a hope for all those that the Father has given to the Good Shepherd. John chapter 6, verse 39. That of all which he hath given me, I should lose none. This is the promise. This is the hope. If Jesus knows you, he will not lose you. If you go astray, he will come after you. He will seek and find you and carry you home, and heaven will rejoice. That is the promise of God. My question to you is, do you know the Good Shepherd? Do you know him? Do you love him? Father, we come to you today asking, would you take us to the place where your son is? Allow us to stand, to kneel, to prostrate before your son. Lord, when we look up, may we be led by his hand. That through this life, Lord, that we become humbled by his grace and his love for us. Who has given his life for us. Lord, take your church and allow us to come to the place where we will experience a life that is in Christ. The newness that's not from this world and the promises that the world would give and will take away. But I pray that we'll all come to a deeper knowledge of you and be led by you through this valley that we are now in. Lord, stop this ignorance of your word, of who you are, of your divinity, and of the calling of the people who are called by your name. And lead us, Lord, in the coming days, 
into life that is more than mere survival, but in abundant life that you have given to us, eternal life that you have given to us, that the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ may be shown through us, that in this dark and perverse nation that we would shine as light of the world. Be glorified in us, Lord, in the people who love you, in the people who are called by your name, who know and are known by you, by our names. Give us an, an ear to be acquainted with your word, with your voice, and lead us, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.